Podcast friends, check out my upcoming show list to see if your city is on my tour. And if not, leave a comment for where I should go next. If you feel like you have issues, baggage, trauma, PTSD, but you feel kind of guilty about it too because it's not like you were a Somali child soldier. (laughs) Or maybe you were. I do not mean to be exclusionary. Welcome my Somali child soldier (laughs) listeners. But if maybe you had a life like mine where there were some issues, there were some bad things that happened that were significant, But you also lived in an area that had a yard of the month club. (laughs) So it's hard to feel like it was too bad. I'm here to defend that. And I'm here to say that you might have symptoms of real PTSD, even if you didn't go through anything super, super traumatic. Or or if you did, this definitely applies to you. But if you feel like you kind of have some baggage and issues and it's like, why? I mean, it wasn't that bad. Um... This is the episode for you. And what's great is I am both a doctor and a mental health professional. I hope you are all getting all of your mental health advice from this podcast. Take the medicines that I recommend. um, Live your life exactly like I am and everything will all work out. Someone in the iTunes reviews, which, as you know, I read each one personally, She actually said she canceled her therapist and just listens to this podcast (laughs) instead. (laughs) With some of the therapists I've seen, I can't, I can't say that's the worst decision. I mean, there could be better decisions, but not maybe not the worst decision. So we're going to talk about that. It's been a while since I've talked about being sane and how you can be more sane and happy. That that was all I talked about last summer. If you look at the podcast episodes from summer 2022, so July and August of 2022, I saw, I think it was seven different therapists, everyone from PhD psychiatrists to hippies who actually made me sign a statement saying, I am aware that they have no credentials at all. And this is not licensed in any way. And by the way, Guess who was more effective? Guess who was more effective? The, the hippies. Um, <laughs> they really were. That that tapping stuff, I did the, uh, what I there's a name for it, where, where you tap yourself while you say things. I know, I know doesn't sound like it would work, but it, it's, it's about being more embodied. It's about being here in the present moment. And for those of us for whom dissociation is a lifestyle, you know what? If you have to bang yourself on the forehead, while saying, I am worthy and I'm not a failure, hey, whatever helps, whatever works. Uh, So that was really interesting. You can, if I know some of you guys, you've just discovered the podcast and you want to go back and binge. If you want to walk with me on my therapy journey last year, that was July and August of 2022. There, there is a bevy of episodes on that topic. So as usual, we get to the main topic in the second part of the show in the first part of the show um my husband had some opinions for me Mm -hmm. right before caitlin was sitting here right before this podcast so you know caitlin brings her four kids dogs whatever over uh for every episode i cook for everybody and we all hang out it's kind of a party and um so we were chatting and my husband thought he would share some opinions (laughs) that um and caitlin do you remember me asking i because i don't remember I didn't see, watch, Caitlin's going to go silent. Like, I don't want to get involved in the full Weiler marriage <laughs> drama. You know, I'm not paid enough for that. Like, that's that's a job in the high six figures <laughs> getting in between the two full Weilers. <laughs> no, but okay, so I'll, uh, spoiler alert, I didn't ask. There was no question. Uh, there, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I have video of this. We are going to play the video. Um, and I am going to share with you how to know, I, my, my tips for blowing off unsolicited opinions <laughs> it is god's plan for my life that i have constant exposure to opinions sometimes i asked for and sometimes i didn't ask for it. it due to the nature of my job um i'm trying to win and make money so for example i will submit my stand-up comedy to my manager who is the best human being in the world he's so wonderful he's also honest that's part of what makes him a good manager and 
the word that he uses that I hate the most, he'll reply to my some bit that I'm doing and just say meh. M E H. And I'm just Ouch. like, oh, ow. And it'll be something that I'm like, that was fire, wasn't it? That was fire. And he replies, meh. So that's an example of great feedback that I asked for. Uh, but, you know, putting yourself out there in public, you're exposed to opinions. Mm-hmm. People have opinions for me. And then, of course, in my home, um, and, and listen, I give my husband opinions too. We are kind of a smack talking family. So, um, I, I've got my Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hours in of hearing other people's opinions Mm -hmm. about me and my life and what I'm doing and my work. And honestly, I am pretty much in a place of peace with it. Pretty much. Um, Was it just today that I was on the Slack channel with Caitlin writing in all (laughs) caps about how livid I was about somebody's stupid opinion yes but (laughs) that is actually better than I was years ago when I would have just turned into a supervillain on the spot Mm -hmm. so I I feel like just writing some all caps messages with seven exclamation marks per sentence on slack (laughs) is progress I think it's progress so you are going to feel a new level of freedom after you hear my sage advice here. So uh, also, don't forget, my tour starts very soon. Very soon. Days from the time this episode airs, I will be in New York City. That one's going to be fun. If you're anywhere near New York City, I also want to note that flights to New York are cheap. I mean, come on, live a little, get on a plane. So we've got the New York City show, Pittsburgh. Caitlin's coming, right? Yeah. Caitlin will be at New York City and Pittsburgh. Oh, 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 oh. I'm so glad. I always forget to say stuff like this. I... Hit the sound effect for I almost forgot to say this and I'm so glad I didn't. Oh, good. <laughs> Got our custom sound effect. Pittsburgh, you guys are in for a treat. I have booked one of my favorite stand-up comics as the opener. But by, by the way, I mean, it's all favorite stand-up comics for every city. This guy is special because he has a stutter. Yes. Oh. My opener in Pittsburgh has a stutter. And boy, is that someone who does not have limiting beliefs. Mm. I, I mean, look, if I, you guys know me, I, I am all about encouraging you. The sky's the limit. You can do whatever you want. Do not see limits. But if I knew someone who had a stutter, I might put my hand on their shoulder and say, hey, son, listen, you can do anything. You can do anything you want in life. There's really only one thing you can't do. And that's be a stand-up comic. That's you can't do that. But anything else it is is open to you because stand-up comedy is all about flow. When you know, the joke has to hit at the right time. When I so I met this guy in Nashville. Zany's in Nashville. We were on the same show, and I talked to him backstage. And I assumed he was someone's manager or, or something like that. And then when they're like, hey, "His name is Donnie Sengstack," and the, and when they said, "Donnie, you're up," I'm like, "Up to do what? <laughs> to do stand-up?" And guys. He crushed. He is hilarious. He had all of us like screaming, laughing. Like he's so funny. So that is Pittsburgh. That is really exciting. The guy in New York too, he is the kindest person I've ever met. I had, the way I met him, I was doing a show. They had booked someone. I'd looked up that person's comedy that I felt really bad about this, but I wasn't going to expose you guys to that. It was, it was not the right fit for my show so at the last minute I had to email them and say hey you know this is why I asked you guys to run it by me um I'm so sorry but you have to unbook this person and find someone else and this guy Michael Terry is who they found and it it just goes to show when you set boundaries and stand up for yourself good things happen Mm -hmm. he is so wonderful he is the maybe the kindest person I've ever met in my life. So he is doing my New York City show. Bunch of great openers after that. Jordan Macon, who you guys know and love, Mm -hmm. he will be in Las Vegas and Salt Lake City. And then we have Philly, Boston, um, D.C. I think, okay, yeah. And then Jordan's doing, uh, Jordan is doing Philly and D.C. And then Boston is this girl. Her humor is so understated. She did Chicago. It's so understated. But she goes into 
female dynamics. It's very funny. She talks about having female roommates and just the tensions that come among women when oh, women yeah. live together, but but not in a hack way of like, yes, we know women are like it's very it's very fresh and interesting, super understated. So, and then for Dallas San Antonio, all of the cities as well. Guys, you know how some influencers if you, th- th- their whole thing is they they take care of the people they love by, they'll put out a vase of flowers and um, and they'll fluff the flowers, whatever that means, before <laughs> their guests come over and, and they'll they'll make a little homemade good. And that, that is how they love people. That's how they take care of people. They, they put all that work into making things beautiful. Some of you guys do that for your guests. I love that. I can't do any of that. Um, none of that is happening. But... I pick great openers for my shows, okay? And honestly, I am like a, a a sane woman arranging her flowers for the guests to come over. Like, oh, I believe a pop of pink would be beautiful here. I'm like, <laughs> you know what? I think that Donnie is more of a Pittsburgh vibe because I just think, you know, with his location and where he's from, and then Holly will be perfect from Boston because she's from Boston. I, I am like, I'm arranging the vase of flowers with my openers. And again, I... I pay for this all out of pocket. I could use local openers who would be garbage and probably very offensive to you yeah. and save a ton of money. I pay for all of this personally. I pay for their travel. I pay for their hotel. I pay for their appearance fee. All so that you guys can have great shows. And if I only had the perfect jingle to wrap it all up. Jen Fulweiler is hitting the road on the maternal instinct tour. So watch where she goes. Just go to J. jfcomedytour.com that is where you get your tickets i would mention austin but it's already sold out so uh okay yes <laughs> yes um okay L- before i go into my husband being wrong and video <laughs> evidence of it i uh, those of you watching on youtube may notice Oh, I forgot to introduce the show. Okay, hang on, hang on, hang on. <laughs> yeah, Welcome to the Jen Fulweiler Show. I am your host, Jen Fulweiler. I am coming to you from Austin, Texas. I am a stand-up comic, best-selling author, and mom of six. This is the podcast where you learn the art of the village hustle. That's being a hot girl, girl boss, who knows that love and family and community are the foundation of all true success. Caitlin is our fabulous producer, and we publish new episodes every Wednesday morning, everyone. And you can get fabulous bonus content content that we work really hard on and love a lot on Patreon. That is patreon.com slash this is Jen. And that link is in the show notes. Also linked to tour tickets. Everything is in the show notes. It's all in the show notes. Okay. Those of you on YouTube will notice I am wearing a football jersey. Football season has started as of the release of this podcast. I would like to make a pitch to you. Stick with me. Don't skip this. Get your (laughs) finger off that forward 15 seconds button (laughs) just listen to me okay listen i would like to make a pitch that you casually follow football this year here is why um football in america is a great community building experience it is a through line through through our culture with all of its problems and all of its diversity and all of the different socioeconomic groups and states i mean when you think about the geographic enormity of the united states i mean the state of texas is bigger than the country of france to give and that's just one state of 50 i mean we got a lot going on in this country and one of the through lines that brings the whole thing together is the sport of football. And that matters. Community matters. Having things in common with the people that you are sharing this land with (laughs) matters. And by the way, for, for people who aren't in the United States, you can put everything I'm about to say about football onto the main sport that the people in your area are into. So if you're in England, soccer. If you're in New Zealand, rugby. 
if you're in Canada, moose chasing. It's whatever <laughs> your sport is, put everything on the belt. <laughs> Sorry, Canada. I'll do a Canada show soon just to make up for that comment. <laughs> so I'm just mad that my cell phone wouldn't work last time I was there. Um, so uh, I love Canada. Anyway, um, <laughs> let me tell you why I care about this. Uh, Longtime listeners and stalkers know that I grew up as an only child and we moved a lot. I think I moved in, I, I think I lived in maybe 15 different cities before my freshman year in high school in, in different states too. So it wasn't, we weren't just moving houses in the same area. This is before the internet. So there was not really an easy way to keep in touch with people. So I'd always be the new kid at schools and and we were we were not religious. I mean, my dad's super atheist. I was super atheist uh, from day one. I was an atheist baby. And I don't even know how you be an atheist baby, but I was. And so there was absolutely zero community of any sort when we would move to a new place because I didn't even have the local church or youth group to meet people. I'd, I'd get thrown into a school. And this was unfortunately... Um, I did feel like getting a perm would be what I needed to pull my look <laughs> together. And I was also way taller than any other kids. So my clothes never fit. My pants were high waters. You know, I, I would try to tuck in a shirt and the kids would all say I had it like pulled up to my armpits. <laughs> Ooh, this really transitions into the trauma <laughs> topic nicely. Um, so my childhood, it, it's really kind of hard to overstate the isolation of my childhood. Also, both of my parents worked. So for many years, I was a latchkey kid. They'd get home at like 7 p.m. So I would not have friends and not talk to anyone in school and uh, get bullied. And then I would go home and I would sit alone until 6 or 7 p.m. And the utter lack of community that I felt cannot possibly be overstated. I, um, it is a disorienting feeling to just feel like there, there's no, there's no group of people that has your back. Cause the other thing is my father was also an only child. So I was an only grandchild on that side of the family and no cousins or aunts or uncles on my dad's side of the family. Now my mom had uh, brothers and sisters, and I had cousins there, but I only saw them once every two years because they lived in always a thousand, two thousand miles away from us. So once every two years, maybe I'd see them. And to this day, I mean, I love them, but I text my cousins maybe once a year. It's like we have one text exchange. And I wish that weren't the case. They're awesome. I love them, but I, we just, we never had an opportunity to know each other. So um, lots of isolation. There was one thing for in this non-religious, you know, non, non-community life of mine that we did have football. And, and that also kind of, for us, acted like a liturgical year when you don't have, you know, I'm Catholic now, so now we have the liturgical year. We have Advent, we have Lent, we have Ordinary Time, we have Christmas, and these are whole seasons. And it does break up the year. It's like, oh, as I gave up sweets during Lent, it's a, it's a penitential time. And I'm failing at all of this, but at least I'm aware that it's a penitential time. It's kind of <laughs> different. But, um, there, you know, when you're atheist, there, there are no atheist seasons. It's like, this is the, this is the time that we think about how God doesn't exist. <laughs> and then for three more weeks, we like really think about how God doesn't exist. You know, we, we read Richard Dawkins for, <laughs> for three weeks. I mean, there's nothing like that. But there was football. And because football is such a popular sport in the United States, we, you know, it, it is something that we just knew a lot of people who followed. That was the one thing that you could get people to talk about and get people to come over and get people interested in. And that community was all that I had. And I'm trying to be all emotional. And these kids are yelling outside. Could you tell these kids I to be quiet out want. there? Okay. <laughs> this is real life, guys. <laughs> Caitlin and I, we, we have 10 kids between us. And they are all right outside the podcast door making noise. <laughs> um, they, um, 
it's all I had. And it and it's all a lot of people have in terms of community. And that is why one thing that we are not going to do, one thing we do not do is we don't make fun of football fans. That is actually something that is it's funny, it really bothers me and it's highly offensive to me when people dismissively say, oh, sports ball, are you watching sports ball? And I, a couple of my kids have done it and I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. Don't say that because that camaraderie of following a football team and rooting for them, I, I feel like there's almost a certain innocence to it that you're kind of putting yourself out there as vouching for this team and the other people who are into this team. And it's like, don't don't make fun of people for being vulnerable because there there is kind of a vulnerability in being a sports fan and there are so many people out there that you know being a being a Steelers fan or being a Cowboys fan or you know being a Kansas City fan it's all they have that's all they have in terms of community and, uh, and and how sad is it, you know, if you root for a team that's like not doing well, you know, the Falcons, like, oh, my God. Um, no, I, they, they, this is their year. It's happening. It's happening. This is their year. So um, so don't make fun of people who follow sports, especially football, because for a lot of people, that is all the community they know. that, And, and it's all the liturgical year they have. But secondly, I want you to give it a shot. I want you to give it a shot following football a little bit because it will help you get to know people, especially if you know anyone who follows football, your coworkers, your spouse, your siblings. It gives you something in common with them. That That's one of the things about our lives being so atomized and we're all in our own worlds and doing our own things. It can be hard to find things in common with people. And, you know, if, if, if you're part of a certain religion, okay, I'm Catholic, so that's good. But there, you run out of things to talk about, you know? <laughs> I mean, we can't be like, so did you pray the rosary? Like, oh, let's lie and be fake about how we practice it. <laughs> you know, it, you run out of things to, to talk about. Football is a way to have fun and exciting conversations with people you don't know and to, and, and, and to get to know them. Um, so I, I have actually taken it to the level that for the first time I am doing fantasy football this year, uh, it, it is already really challenging my mental health. It is, I didn't realize I have this latent competitive side. (laughs) I'm in the league with our neighbors and Caitlin is in the same league. So at some point, Caitlin and I will play each other. Our teams. It's going to be an awkward Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, well, no. Well, according to the AI chatbot that did a write-up on my team, (laughs) I am going, it says I'm going to lose all season. So now I have an AI chatbot as an enemy. It was so (laughs) offensive what it wrote about my team. It was, I'm like, are you sure? (laughs) Are you sure this was an AI chatbot? Like, it just seems like one of my enemies wrote this it was so offensive um and so we're in a neighbor's league and and a neighbor made a comment it was kind of genuinely dismissive it wasn't just fun trash talking it was like it it was like you know i i can't believe you made such a bad decision i don't know where this came from but i was like meet me at the mailboxes and say this to my face. We're going to fight. Like we are, <laughs> like, I was ready <laughs> to fight them. I was seriously ready. I mean, I was ready to get in a physical fight over this. So this is, um, it's, it's bringing out my latent competitive side and I'm going to find, Oh, here. Okay. Here's my write up. This is unbelievable. <laughs> Supposedly this is AI generated. So now I have a beef with an AI chat bot. My team is called the mermaids. Cause that's awesome. It says, The mermaids sink to the bottom of the draft ocean. That is the AI summary of my fantasy football picks. It says, in the neighbor's league, the mermaids had the unfortunate privilege of drafting first with a draft grade of D minus and a projected finish of 11th out of 12th. It seems like their luck ran out before the draft even began. Oh, listen, they're they're doing little puns and analogies on the mermaid theme shut down ai elon musk is right we have to stop this until we figure out what's going on this ai chatbot goes on to say despite their best efforts 
the mermaids are projected to have a dismal record of one 13 zero. So one win, 13 losses, leaving them swimming in the depths of the <laughs> league standings. Shut it down. AI is dangerous. That is impressive. <laughs> Their projected points of 1,793.1 are as elusive as a mermaid's tail. Like, okay, shut up, chatbot. That's not even, if you were human, you would know <laughs> that mermaids' tails aren't known to be elusive. That's like not a phrase. No one's like, oh, I can't find my car keys. It's like a mermaid's tail. <laughs> that doesn't, it, like, no one says that. So you think you're so cool, you AI chatbot? <laughs> Who knew you could have beef with an AI chatbot? <laughs> Making it clear that this team will struggle to make a splash on the fantasy football scene. I will fight this chatbot. I want it to turn itself into a robot so that I can fight it. I am ready to start swinging. Um, only time will tell. Oh, wait, wait here. It's a risky strategy that could either lead to a tidal wave of success or leave them stranded on a desert island. <laughs> only time will tell if the mermaids can rise from the depths and, and prove that they're more than just a fishy fantasy team. <laughs> I was so proud of my name, the mermaids. And I have an AI chat bot calling my team a fishy fantasy team. <laughs> What is going on? And by the way, no one else's was like, Caitlin's wasn't like this. No. She didn't get insulted by the AI <laughs> chat, but even my husband also got a bad grade. He got a D and it was just like, yeah, they're probably not going to win. There were no little puns and <laughs> analogies. Like none. Man, I'm telling you, this is, it's, the, I, I mean, this is, it's a new me. It's a new me heading into the, the fantasy football team. <laughs> um, but listen, it's too late for you. I'm not suggesting that you play fantasy football per se that that's it's too late maybe you do it next year but getting into football can really be a lot of fun it can be a community building experience and here is before I wrap this up here is um all you need to know about how to follow football okay here's the hit the quick tip sound effect Caitlin our special quick tip sound effect yes this is all you need to know to follow football, okay? The teams take turns having the ball. Each team has four tries to move the ball forward 10 yards. That is called a down. If they cannot accomplish that in four tries, they have to give the ball back to the other team. That's it. That's it. That's all you need to know. <laughs> so if you hear the announcer saying third and two, that means third down, third try and two yards to go until they have completed the 10 total yards. So they say, all right, this, this matters a lot. It's third and two. Well, the reason that matters is third is their second to last try because on their fourth try, I mean, that's kind of it. So just try following football, see if it adds value to your life. And if you need teams to root for, you can root for my teams. Let's help me prove this AI chat bot wrong. So um, one of this, this, auto write-ups criticism of my picks is I have too many players from the Saints. So basically, I live and die by the Saints performance this year. So if you would like a team um, to root for, root for the Saints. Also, Kansas City, their quarterback, his name is Patrick Mahomes. He's a really sweet guy. Mm -hmm. He married not his high school sweetheart, but his junior high sweetheart. He, he loves his wife so much. They've got a couple of kids. He's just the sweetest guy. He's from Texas. So he plays uh, for the Kansas City Chiefs. And um, yeah, they're, I'm, and also I sell well in Kansas City. <laughs> I kind of do the teams I root for based on where I sell. <laughs> they always sell out my shows. So if you're looking for a couple of teams to follow, just get into the storylines, root for the Chiefs and the Saints. So that is my pitch on following football. I just think you should consider it because if you live in the United States, it is a great community building experience. It will give you things to talk about with people. You don't have to know all the stats or whatever. It's it's just it's just a fun thing to do and you don't have to know a lot about it to follow the to follow the um to follow the games and stuff. Okay, so let's move on to um my husband had some opinions <laughs> for me 
about a meal board that I set up in our kitchen. And um, I didn't ask, but I got the opinions. And this is a good opportunity for me to share with you guys what I have learned about whose opinions to listen to (laughs) and when. The reason this matters is if you want to be awesome in life, sometimes you do need to listen to opinions. It's not good to shut out everyone's opinions always. However, you also got to know when to say, uh, didn't ask, don't care. And I'm moving on. I'm going to stay in my lane and keep doing what I'm doing. And I do not care. So I will give you that litmus test. But let's let's hear this brave man. Let's hear a little bit from this brave man looking at my meal Joe board that I bought and giving me his opinion about this. And I asked him what was confusing. What is why? why so I made this win for me. But what's wrong with that? What, what's confusing about it? Very clear. I'm not confused. It's just what did you just say? <laughs> what? I don't. Live, no, we'll give him a minute. <laughs> live, laugh, love conveys like your family philosophy. Pause it, Caitlin. This tells you like, I mean, how many words are there? One, two. You couldn't hear one thing he said there. He said, I'm not confused. This part got cut. It just doesn't add a lot of value. <laughs> he said it doesn't add a lot of value. He said having a meal board is the same as having a live, laugh, love sign in your house. Okay, Caitlin, go ahead. (laughs) Two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's seven words on this that have any kind of information content. I mean, what is there to say about hot dogs? Like, should I describe what a hot dog is on the night that we're having? I mean, you haven't had this thing for 18 years donald's now off to college and like now we suddenly have a chalkboard menu because i have time now uh, we- when you got this a week ago i genuinely thought it was a decoration and when you when you updated it this week i was surprised i was like wow she, i guess she's gonna do this every week <laughs> i thought it was just like a de- caitlin is like <laughs> Caitlin's going to leave. I mean, she's just like, I can't. Well, show them the green this. box and how much I love that, though. Oh, oh okay. So now, okay, now we are going to go to, I, I created a, a box as a visual representation of consequences for when, when the kids don't at least look at their to-do lists, their chore lists. I had been telling them, listen, I, I'm going to have to take away phones. I never take away phones. That, that is not part of my parenting thing. But as a leader, I need to be a good leader for my house. I don't have the mental energy to check in with everyone on the seven things that they were supposed to do today. I just don't have the mental energy. So I told them I really don't want to take away phones, but I I just have to because it's the only way I can get you guys' attention. And, um, and, and, and I understand. I mean, they're, they are busy. They're generally very helpful, but they're busy with school. So I said, I just, I just need a real potent reminder. Um, <laughs> and the threat of having the phone taken away will be it. So I don't like doing this, but I will. And rather than just verbally telling them, I created a, a, a box and there's a sign on it that says phones of people who didn't check lists and it's locked with a key. And so my husband approves of it. He doesn't like the meal board. He thinks it's useless, but he likes this box. Okay, go ahead, Caitlin. Now this is Joe approved. It's just a little reminder. See, like, this has practical value. Like, this does something, you know? Yeah, this has the practical value of telling you what we're eating. So they both. It shares a tiny bit of information. Everything I do, the calendar, the chore lists, the phone jail, it all has practical value. I, I don't like, do things I'm glad you mentioned the calendar. Why don't you just put the dinner on the calendar? There's not room. We have all this other stuff on the calendar. Oh, and it's not aesthetic. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not aesthetic with like the drip coming off of the Monday, but it's not aesthetic. <laughs> That's no more pot pie for you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So that, and by the way, of course, we have that on uh, this, these episodes are all now on YouTube if you would like to see what my husband looks like and just, you know, see the man actually delivering his bad takes, <laughs> like have the actual visual on it. Uh, JF on YouTube.com will redirect you right to my YouTube yeah. page, JF on YouTube.com, and the link is in the show notes. Um, so, uh, 
so he just doesn't get it at all. The summary is he says that it looks it's it's the equivalent of having a live, laugh, love sign. There is absolutely no point in having my aesthetic meal board <laughs> that I was very proud of up in the kitchen. Now, you may notice that th- this is not offensive to me at all. I, I don't. I don't care. This this is how Joe and I are. This is how we interact with each other. It's a lot of batting ideas around and uh, giving each other feedback that neither one of us ask for. But that's how we are. That is the culture of our marriage. That's also why it's good to identify the culture of your marriage so that you know when to kind of roll with it. Some people have very romantic cultures to their marriage like oh hey sweetie love you kissy kissy I don't know (laughs) but and I we're just we just have a different culture we we try to use terms of endearment and things like that but that's just not us so it kind of sounds weird it's like hey sweetums uh listen (laughs) I need you to look over this spreadsheet because the conditional formatting is just not working baby chums uh can you please like i don't it's just not it's not as we are very direct people we like to talk about ideas so it's helpful to know the the culture of your marriage and ours is very much a constantly i mean you can't say a word in my house among the two of us and my husband can't either without it being evaluated like i'm going to the store is this the most efficient time to go to the store? Should you get something else off the list? I mean, we can't do anything without analyzing it to death. So I'm getting feedback on on my little board here. And so uh, here is here is how to know when you should listen to someone who is giving you feedback. It's spoiler alert, not listening to this man at all on this one. You'll notice that his words related to my meal board Um, don't pass any of these litmus tests. And so this is a good thing to think about if you have a mother-in-law who's up in your business, a boss who's giving you feedback, a spouse who's giving you feedback. There are times when you need to listen. They're They're saying something good and you need to listen and don't let your ego get all stung and hurt and convince you that you, you know, need to be defensive about it. When someone gives you feedback, try to shut your mouth and just listen. I didn't do that at all. You hear, I didn't do that one bit in the video. I was talking smack right back. But in general, just listen. And then, well, first of all, if they are wrong, they will very often talk themselves into a corner and, and point out their own arguments about why why they're wrong. If I hadn't interrupted Joe, he probably would have kept talking And said, yeah, like, why do we need a meal, aesthetic meal board? All it does is make the kitchen look beautiful and give people critical information at a glance. (laughs) Wait a minute. This is actually a great idea. So when you let people talk, I know it, it feels like you're losing. It feels like you're losing the argument. Like you might forget your great points if you don't jump in. I'm telling you, listen, guys, listen, trust me, trust me. You will do better in the argument if you just let that person talk and talk and talk because they they will they will end up talking themselves into all sorts of bad points and it's okay if you forget a couple of your points because either they have a strong argument or they don't and that and and jumping in with every little thing that you have to say is is not going to make an enormous difference so let them talk and honestly don't even defend yourself really i mean if someone is if this is unsolicited feedback, if it is your mother-in-law telling you about the way you do laundry or the way she raised her kids or you shouldn't be giving the baby formula or whatever, do they really want to affect change or are they just virtue signaling? You know, <laughs> that a lot of times if you just let them get that out of their system, that's actually all they wanted. They did not actually want to see you change. They just wanted to to fuss and chirp and talk. <laughs> so... um, then once you've let them get it out of their system, maybe there's something for you to learn there. Maybe there's something for you to think about. So here, here are the questions you ask yourself. Should I listen to this person's feedback? And, and again, we'll, we'll see that Joe's feedback on my meal board didn't, none of this applies. Um, first of all, this isn't a question of them, but a question of yourself. Why did you make this choice? What is 
your vision. So, for example, let's say your mother-in-law is criticizing you because you gave the the baby formula. So you stop and say, okay, wait, first, before I listen to anything she's saying, why did I do this? And then you go into your reasonings of, you know, of why you made that choice. You're like, oh, the kid's three. And your mother's like, I breastfed your husband to that. You know, I mean, (laughs) it could, you know, you need to get in touch with your vision (laughs) and why you did that. (laughs) And then ask yourself, I mean, is it a good vision? So for example, with my meal board, one of the things that I like to do for my family is do things that create a home culture and warm, homey memories. Nine times out of 10, I fail at this. Nine times out of 10, it doesn't work at all. In in the last episode, in episode 171, I was talking about how I put up a, a map with pins of where we have been so that the kids could have these memories of like, oh my gosh, we went there. But then it ended up just messing with their minds because random friends and them, they they would put pins in the board like just for fun. So everyone w- would be like, when did we go to Baton Rouge, Louisiana? You know, <laughs> when did we go to the middle of the ocean? Like that's the Marianas Trench. Like when were we there? <laughs> and so it just really messed with their minds. And then the whole thing fell down and we just had pins all over the floor that I didn't fully clean up. So I'm not saying I'm good at this. I'm just saying I like to do it. And so I just thought I could see that being a nice childhood memory. The kids are very hungry when they get home from school. And that would be nice if they thought, oh, you know what? When I got up this morning, I saw that tonight we're doing ravioli with Alfredo sauce. That's, a, oh, I can't wait to get home. That sounds amazing. And it's written on an aesthetic chalkboard looking board. And it looks like something you'd see in a coffee shop. To me, that feels very homey. That feels very welcoming. And it instills a certain mood. It instills a certain vibe, a certain energy in my children's memories. So that is step one. I got in touch with that vision. Why did I do this? Listen to that. That's a beautiful vision. I like that vision. So any yap, 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 you know, about the mood board, like we have to weigh that against my very well thought out vision. A lot of times we make decisions in life that um, a lot of times we make decisions in life that we we didn't realize what our vision was. So if someone is criticizing you for it, it's actually a really good thing to do to hit the pause button and remind yourself, pitch it to yourself. Okay, why did I do this? I must have had a good reason. So do that first. Second, does this person have experience in this area? So in the case of my husband and doing the meal planning and the the meal board, no, that, that no, he does not. <laughs> we have a great division of labor. We are both very practical people. We've never, neither one of us have, have hangups on like w- this person has to do that. We've always just been like, what makes most sense? So, you know, when I was staying home with the kids and constantly having babies, obviously I, I was doing the vast majority of anything that had to be done and housework. And now we divide it up different ways. So suffice it to say, my husband is very helpful. He does so much. It's extraordinary. He's a real super husband. It's it's amazing. But one area that has always been mine that I just do is meal planning. So that I've, I've, he's almost never done that, except if I'm out of town and it's an emergency. That is not his forte. That is not his wheelhouse. So, oh, we can just put, it, put an X over that. Does this person X? Does this person have experience in this particular area? Nay. <laughs> Nay. Um, second, uh, they are, I guess this is the third thing. Okay, so first, check your own vision. Two, do they have experience in this area? Three, does this person share your vision in this area? So uh, again, no. Uh, uh, Joe is people's best qualities are also their worst qualities. And one of my wonderful husband's best qualities is that he's not into froofy, frilly extras. He does not care that I have not decorated the house, that the house doesn't look like an influencer's house. He, he doesn't care. As long as it's basically organized and not a total dump and not filthy, he is very gracious about like let's just have an efficiently run house it's fine if you know that one picture has been hanging sideways for two months like whatever so that's <laughs> great but the downside is when I do froofy frilly things like put up an aesthetic meal board he doesn't get it so he does he share my vision in this area no 
He doesn't. And again, to go back to the mother-in-law example, that if if she's taught, if she is criticizing you in an area, maybe she does have the expertise, like she does have experience in this, but she doesn't share your vision. Then this you're going to have to put a big question mark next to that opinion. And then finally, this is the big one. Do you admire their outcomes in this area of life? Do you admire the results that they have gotten when they implemented their <clears throat> bad ideas <laughs> in this area of life? So for again, for your mother-in-law, let's say, okay, she does have a lot of experience. She raised a few kids and she's telling you what to do, but all of her kids run meth labs or are in jail. So you would say, okay, I do not admire the way your family has turned out. I do not admire the results that you have gotten through your way of doing things. And, and you wouldn't say this to your face if you're non-confrontational <laughs> like I am. You'd be like, okay, sounds good. And Eight. then furiously write about it in your journal. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's how I would roll. But so just to yourself, you would say, okay, this person is giving me advice. Do I admire their outcomes? And, and if the answer is yes, then honestly, listen to them. Let's say your, your mother-in-law raised a beautiful, amazing family. Your, your, your brother-in-law is your life coach. Um, your sister-in-law is your nutrition consultant. They are healthy. They are thriving. They are faithful. This is just everything you've ever dreamed of in a family. Okay, may, then maybe listen to your mother-in-law. She might have some good points. But if you don't admire the outcomes that she got, Got to factor that in when she is telling you how to do things. But but when you really start with that, getting in touch with your own vision, pausing all of your thoughts, all of the, this is so offensive, why did this person say this? Pause everything and say, but why did I do this? And and what's the value? And, and why am I making this decision? Maybe even write it down. That will really help you stay strong when you realize that the other three are like, ah, ah. Uh, no, this person doesn't. Nope. Like, like when my husband feeds the kids, he's so helpful. He is more than willing to feed the kids. He'll be like, Jen, you look like you're tired. Hey, why don't you rest? I will feed the kids. Like, hey, sweetie, go to bed. And that, you know, the sweetie sounds awkward because we're not good at terms of endearment. <laughs> and um, he'll say, look, just rest. Super husband. And then later I'll be like, hey, did you feed the kids? And he'll be like, yes, I grilled up two large bratwurst and I threw them on the table. And I think the kids saw them. So, you know, that's not an outcome that I'm personally going for when it comes to dinners for the family. So these are the questions you have to ask. And to give you an example of, of feedback that can be good, like when I'm talking to my manager about my current comedy hour that you will see when you get tickets, jfcomedytour.com, when I'm talking to him, so first of all, what is my vision to, to create an incredible hour that will just make your day when you watch it, you'll laugh, you'll feel less alone. So that's my vision. When my manager gives me feedback, does he have experience in this area? Oh, tons. Like it's incredible. Yes. Does he share my vision in this area? Yes. We both want to make money and have the comedy <laughs> millions come in, but also we want to bless people and delight people with truly, truly well-crafted comedy. Um, do I admire this person's outcome in this area of life? Yes, my manager is one of the best managers in LA. So yes, I do. I admire his outcomes in this area of life. So that is where, like, it just makes sense. Of course, I listen to him very closely when he gives me comedy feedback. So that is how you can evaluate these sorts of things. And I am glad that my family can be an example to you guys of, <laughs> of when you get feedback that you maybe uh, did not necessarily need or want when you should listen. Don't forget that we always do an after party on Patreon where we keep the cameras rolling and we keep chatting about this subject or related subjects. And then there's another level of Patreon where I do get ready with me videos where I do my makeup. Like today I have a smoky eye that I'm doing. I, so I do things like that. And then I talk about, I go into more details about my business problems, how I'm solving either a, a business challenge or a work-life balance, a family challenge. I go into all sorts of details while I am getting ready. You can find the Patreon link in the show notes, or it is also at J, wait, no, 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 patreon.com slash this is Jen. <laughs> okay, here's how the subject of post-traumatic stress and, and just having baggage and having 
issues, even for those of us who grew up in a first world country. Um, Here's how this came up. Um, We had been out of town with the kids and we took two cars. So Joe and his kids, were they were in one car and I got home first. I had three children with me and we had had, we left the dog home and we, we had a neighbor dog sitting for us and the neighbor did a, a great job. A friend of ours um, did a great job, you know, no problems. And um, <laughs> be with me. Uh, Caitlin, we can't hold hands anymore. Your, <laughs> your, your studio over there is too far away. <clears throat> Friends, Caitlin, do some storytelling music. I I think I need something to help me get through this. We walked into our house. I don't know what that dog ate. Uh (laughs) I don't know what. I I, I don't I don't know if the dog got Ebola (laughs) while we were gone. Uh, We knew we knew immediately my daughters that my oldest daughter walked in. And said, um, the smell was like, it was like almost walking into a curtain. The smell was almost tangible, like like you could see it. It was like walking into a wall of smell. I was walking up to the house. She had walked in first. I was walking up, carrying my bags. She turns to me. She walks out. She turns to me, pale as a ghost, which is actually her normal complexion, <laughs> but... <laughs> But but even more so, and she said, I'll never forget, she said, I wish there were something I could do to keep you from seeing this. <laughs> I don't know how to describe what was all over our uh, front room carpet. I don't know how to make sense of life when all of our downstairs is hardwood, except for one small area. <laughs> that is carpeted and and this is it, it that's what we hit that it was this small area i will not burden your mind because there are some mental visuals that you cannot unsee <laughs> i won't go into detail all i will tell you is that i will never look at chocolate soft serve ice cream Ugh. the same way again <laughs> i lost my mind okay we can Calm the music. Um, I, I, well, first of all, I, I turned to the kids and I said, I can't, this is not my dog. This is my husband's dog. I'm not the dog person. I, I, I turned to, the, I turned to the kids and I said, I, I literally can't, like, I'm not kidding. I can't clean that up. I just, I, and I told my husband that when he got the dog, I said, let's all, let's be clear. Can Jen handle dogs? No. So we, I want to be clear about what my role in this will be. This is your dog. I never said, that I could clean up an ocean of dog diarrhea. I never signed up for that. <laughs> never. And so, so it was, so it was, uh, I forget what other kid was with us, but definitely my two daughters, um, my, my oldest daughter and one of my middle daughters. And I just told them, I was like, we'll sit outside until dad gets here. We will. I mean, I, there's, I mean, not even a chance. And then I thought, see, this is why the comedy millions have to come in. Because if my husband were not on the way home, the, I, I kid you not, I would have had to hire someone. I mean, the level at which I couldn't is, it just can't be overstated. I would have sold the house <laughs> As is furnished, I would have just called a real estate agent and said, put it on MLS, say house is fully furnished. Don't mind the smell, <laughs> you know, great for dog people. It'll, it's already, you can't ruin this house because it's already ruined. I would have sold it as is and never set foot in that house again. Um, my daughter, who is good with animals, she actually offered to clean it up and I paid her handsomely. Oh, I was <laughs> making it rain money. I mean... <laughs> Uh, if she and if she hadn't offered to do it, I'm not kidding. I would have called like a pet sitting service or something. I mean, there's oh, I I was so traumatized by it, and the house smelled so bad. Oh, yeah. It was such a mess. We couldn't get the smell out. And my oldest daughter, she and I are very similar in temperament. Um, fragile, do best when we are sitting alone in dark rooms. Like we're not the mountains of dog diarrhea cleaning up hardy. <laughs> 
kinds of people. And we, we really, we have that in common. And she made a really good point. She actually texted me and she said, this is, this is exactly the village thing that you, that you talk about on your podcast. Um, actually, let me read it to you. I, I have the text up right here. She says, our swift recovery from the dog diarrhea incident <laughs> is a great example of village hustle. Um, like, imagine coming home and I had just been alone and a dog <laughs> released its bowels all <laughs> over your pristine, like, white, uh, your, your, your pristine white carpet and you have no one to help you clean it up and no one to even talk to about it. And she got me thinking. I was like, yeah, that is that is a really interesting point and mm-hmm. something that I really feel from my childhood. And it jibes with it really jibes with what I experienced in when I did all of those therapies and and I was going through like how do you release stored up stress PTSD and and essentially PTSD is stress that has been unprocessed what what I learned in as I was studying PTSD and how you release pent up stored up stress is that the way any traumatic event is released. So really any kind of stress, like you get a flat tire or something horrific happened in your childhood, big stress or small stress. One of the main ways it is released is, first of all, physically. Uh, If you see in in that famous book, uh, The Body Keeps the Score, they talk about how if you see an animal that was almost eaten by a lion and gets away, every time you will see that animal shake like it it shakes itself so it it shakes off it it's trauma release um a lot of forms of dancing especially religious dancing there are a lot of churches where people get slain in the spirit and think about this what what is that they shake they shake when they're they're slain in the spirit and i'm not suggesting that the holy spirit is not also at work but it is also it's it's trauma release because you you are shaking and then the second way that you release any kind of trauma big or small is in a village with your community that it is that is our main stress relieving outlet and for those of us who don't have community for those of us who aren't surrounded by other people a lot of times relatively small stresses in life can end up acting as PTSD, can get blocked and built up as really major stresses that end up triggering us, that end up sending us into a spiral. Because that's essentially what what, it, what a trigger is. This is, boy, it, how is this podcast for you? You're, you're learning all <laughs> sorts of stuff about mental health. A trigger is when your brain reverts to the thinking patterns and the, the your neurons are firing in the same way as the neurons were firing at the time the trauma happened. So they actually did studies with, there was a guy who was in a terrible car accident. It was like a 20 car pileup. A bunch of people were killed and this guy got trapped in his car and there, were, there was fire coming towards him and he couldn't get out. And he was, he and his wife, were rescued at just the 11th hour, just at the last minute they got them out as the flames were coming towards him. So obviously major candidate for PTSD there. And they hooked him up to MRIs so they could watch his brain patterns. So they would get normal brain patterns, just, hey, what'd you do today? Did you get coffee? What kind of coffee did you like? Then they intentionally triggered him into something reminded him of the accident or touched on those emotions. And suddenly... His brain fired as if he were that guy right there currently trapped in a, a burning car. That same, same neural patterns. And so um, I'll get an example from my life. So I was bullied as a kid and it was traumatic and blah, blah, blah. So in, in my career, sometimes when I feel rejection, I feel like I was intentionally not invited to be part of a group. It'll be something dumb like, I'm there to say hi to a comic and and I feel like 
They don't want to let me in the green room or, or something. Now, nobody would like that. Everyone would feel like, man, that bums me out. That's I feel bad about myself because people aren't, um, they're not welcoming me. Uh, with me, because that is a trigger, I feel it. I feel it happening. My neurons start firing like I am a 14-year-old with a bad perm, <laughs> high water shorts, and, and braces. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I, be, I revert back to being that person. And that's why it, if, you, if you've ever said you have a temper, if you have a, a temper where sometimes you, just, you can't control yourself, like you get so angry and it's, you're like a wild horse who can't be controlled. Or if you kind of go the other way, maybe you don't have a big vocal temper, but something happens and you just get so depressed or down or discouraged and you feel like garbage about yourself and you can't pull out of it. That was probably a trigger. Someone I know was talking about, they they had a, a stepmom who was very hurtful with them and would constantly tell her that that she was fat and that she was not good looking and it was the the mother had passed away and so there was just a lot of trauma at the time of you know their biological mom had passed away and then the stepmom would just be like you look terrible look at you know look at look at how fat you are in that outfit and so now as as a grown woman in her 40s if something happened that made her feel like people thought she looked overweight or not attractive or whatever, it could send her spiraling into this this self-hating depression that could take her days to pull out of. That's a trigger. So to take it back to dog diarrhea and <laughs> what I learned in, in therapy – you might have symptoms like this. You might say like, okay, ooh, that, that's, that's hitting the nail on the head. That sounds familiar. But a lot of us don't treat it because we say, look, okay, yes, yeah, fine. My stepmother called me fat or like me, I got bullied at school. Okay, whatever. Like I went to a bad school. The kids were terrible. I still wish ill on them to this day. <laughs> haven't, I haven't worked on the, you know, Jesus says to forgive your enemies. And I think Jesus hates these people too. He was there. He saw what they did. Um, <laughs> and, or, or whatever, you know, the car accident, whatever it is. Uh, a, a lot of times we'll say, yeah, but that's so dumb. I mean, there are people with real problems in the world. There are people who have experienced real hardship and real tragedy. So, I mean, whatever, like, I don't need therapy for this. Like, I, come on. But here's the thing, bet you didn't have a village to process it with. I bet you didn't have a village because if you did, you would have had that pressure release valve. And that is the point my daughter made in the incident that I just can't see chocolate soft serve ice cream <laughs> the same ever again. Because she said, think about coming home to that alone. Think about encountering that alone as it was. First of all, someone else in my village cleaned it up, which is really what matters. I was able to be the village member who paid for it to be cleaned up. So that was my role in in the village. But the other thing is we laughed about it. That is one of the that is one of the key processing things of a village is you can laugh about it. Granted, this is just dog excrement. But <laughs> even for things that are a bigger deal, you can talk about it. You can tell your war stories and in in the traditional ways that villages process things, you tend to move. That's trauma release when you are moving, when you tell this story. I saw a YouTube video that I wish I could find. I cannot find it again. Someone was talking about this and and he, he said he came from this, there was a lot of community that he lived around all of his cousins, tons of cousins and aunts and uncles. And it was up in the Northeast somewhere back in the, in the 40s when people had more close-knit communities. So everybody knew everybody. And he said he had, he had an abusive father who was an alcoholic. The dad would physically abuse the kids. And that's obviously, it's terrible. It's very traumatic. And, but he said he, he didn't have as much PTSD or residual trauma as people who experienced way less abuse because he had all these cousins. So he'd go out and play ball with his cousins and be like, yeah, my dad, my dad's such a bleep bleep. And my dad did this. And, and man, I'm one of these days. I'm going to take my dad. You know, he'd kind of act it out. Like I'm going to beat up my dad right back. And the cousins would say like, I know my dad, he does the same thing. And they had that trauma release 
of sharing trauma, acting out the stories, acting out what you're going to do next time, telling the tall tales. And, and frankly, I think the tall tales can even be part of the trauma release. Like my dad said this to me and I said, yeah, you know what? And like, yeah, none <laughs> of that actually happened. But that's kind of part of the trauma release to tell the tall tale, to say like, yeah, that, that, that bully came at me. And, and oh, you know what? I actually just remembered I did this when I moved to a new school. Somehow the bullying came up and, and I'd found a little bit of a community. And so I'd say, yeah, those bullies, uh, they, tried to, they tried to push me against that wall. But I was like, do you have any idea who I am and what's going to happen to you if you do this? None of that actually happened. <laughs> like none of that happened. But honestly, it was cathartic once I found my little temporary village before we moved again to tell the tall tale about, how, yeah, I stood up to that bully. Yeah, yeah, I I did that, and I and I didn't take that, and it it felt cathartic to imagine that 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 that's what actually happened, and you see that in tribes, you see it with the Vikings, you see it with the Native Americans. What did they do after battles, which are trauma? Nothing more traumatic than being in a battle. Ba I mean, man, back when these you know with tribal fighting and with the Vikings fighting, I mean, you had close friends and family members who were killed, who you watched die in every battle. What did these tribal people do after battles? They would go back to the campfire. Every time, you see this across human history. They would go back to the campfire. They would break bread. They'd share food. In the Vikings case, they'd have some mead. They'd drink it out of an elk's horn. And they would tell the tall tales, frankly, that weren't always based in reality. It's like, yeah, I had five swords and I took down 10 men. You guys just didn't see it. You know, <laughs> They'd tell the tall tales. But they would dance and they would act it out. There's so many images of people dancing around the campfire to get ready for battle after battle. That is trauma release. That's trauma release. We don't have any of that. And that is why you could end up with PTSD and being triggered just from like maybe five years ago, your spouse said something pretty unkind. It was, it was just kind of a nasty thing to say. But now, to this day, when you're reminded of it, you start spiraling. You start mm -hmm. fixating. You're so angry at them. You go into a depression. And, you're, and there's part of you that's like, okay, this was five years ago. Like, <laughs> that they didn't stab me. It was just a rude comment. You know why I bet that is triggering to you? And it's making your whole neurology change to, to bring you back to that moment when the trauma originally recur occurred. You didn't have a village to process it with. If you were living 10,000 years ago and your, your tribal husband had made that rude comment, an hour later, you would be walking down to the water well with the women of your tribe. It would be just women. So there would be kind of a safe space to chat. And you'd start telling the tall tales. You'd be like, my husband said this to me. You know what I said to him? I said to him, right? I said, you better. <laughs> it's like, okay, none of that happened. But you're telling the tall tale. And, the, and then women would chat ch too. They'd be like, I know it. I know it. Husbands, what are you going to do? <laughs> and, and then the other thing is you would be moving. That's such a key component. You would be, let's say, washing the, the clothes down at the river, you, you know, rubbing them against rocks or whatever women used to do to, to wash clothes. That is a key component. This is not just texting your friend. There's no movement in that other than your thumbs. That has mm. always been part of village processing that villages tend to do their daily work together. And so you're, yeah, again, you're, you're taking organs out of the buffalo to eat, <laughs> you know, and like skinning the buffalo to make like whatever for your teepees and, and you're cooking the food and you're doing this as you tell your sisters and your cousins and, and the other females of your village, you're doing this while you tell them what happened. And so you have the combination of that verbal expression of what happened of the initial trigger point you tell some tall tales about what you did which is everyone kind of knows wishful thinking and then you're doing it while you are moving so you have a physical release of stress notice how many of us have none of that and so that's why i realized i i felt like such a stupid basket case that I had real symptoms of PTSD. I mean, you would have thought I was a nom. I had real symptoms of PTSD that were really kind of shutting down my life. I mean, it was it was really becoming a problem how 
one little thing would happen and I would be in a four day depression that just sent me to very dark places that I just couldn't get out of or, or I'd snap. I, I didn't tend to go the loud aggression route because, um, that is not the family culture that I come from, but occasionally I would, I'd, I'd snap at people and I'd start yelling and I felt so dumb. Again, I grew up in a neighborhood with a yard of the month club. My parents were married. I mean, they eventually got divorced. But for my childhood, my parents were married. We were middle class. I mean, we had some, we had our financial struggles that were serious. But I mean, we were never homeless. We were never living in our car. I mean, come on, like, it's not that bad. And so I just couldn't figure out why I was so heavily triggered. And that's one of the reasons I resisted talking to anyone or reading books or watching YouTube videos or getting therapy. It's just like, this is dumb. This is dumb. You know, the middle class white girl, like, shut <laughs> up. It wasn't that bad. But I didn't have any way to process it. I, I, there was no village processing. And so the, the relatively, quote unquote, little things that did happen, not to minimize what I went through. I mean, I went through some bad stuff. But again, I wasn't a child soldier. And um, the, quote unquote, little things that did happen, they all got stuck inside me. They got stuck inside me because there was no way to let them out. I, I've told you that we were good friends. Before my dad died, we were good friends with um, a few families. that They were immigrants from Mexico, and they had such an enormous uh, influence on me because my grandparents back in the day, they, they spoke fluent Spanish because my dad grew up in Mexico, and my grandparents spent pretty much all of their adult lives in Mexico and South America. So when they moved back to Central Texas, this was the 70s, there were not a lot of fluent Spanish speakers. And so word got around the Mexican immigrant community that my grandparents' house was the place to be. And so they would hire people who needed work. A lot of these immigrants needed work. Uh, we'll just say they didn't ask a lot of questions about who had papers and who didn't. And um, I got really immersed in that experience of the immigrant culture of, you know, you, again, did why do we want to pay in cash? We we don't know. Let's just, we just like cash. We like the way it looks. No reason. It's not because people can't have a bank account. And and these, uh, this these families had the most tremendously positive impact on my life. Interesting side note: they were all Catholic. And as an as an atheist, I always kind of noticed that 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 was always on my radar that they were so loving and just so good to me. I mean, that the the love that radiated from these families was like nothing I had ever seen or experienced. And they were really that model of village to me. So I was talking to one of our friends and um, let's say, I'll call her Maria. Let's say her name is <laughs> Maria. So, um, and so her father, when she was a, a young child, her father was murdered when she was about seven and they had seven kids. They were so poor that her mother would go to the local fruit vendor and get rotting fruit, the fruit that he could not sell to, to give to the kids. Once a week, she could get a piece of cheese that was the size of the palm of her hand. She would split it among the seven kids, and that was really exciting for them. Uh, they did not have a roof. It was made of leaves, so when it rained, they would get rained on in the house. They did not have pillows, and... They never had blankets until one day the local bar owner was resurfacing his pool tables. And so he took the felt off the, the pool tables and he gave it, he gave this used roughed up uh, pool table felt to that, you know, had all the scuff marks on it and everything so super thin. And he gave it to Maria's mother and that was their blankets. And they were just like, God is so abundant. Like, how could we possibly thank God for his goodness? This is unbelievable. And his mom would spend all her free time cleaning the local church, like just to make it look beautiful, to just thank God for everything he'd done for her. For toys, they would go down to the local dump. Like you've seen pictures of kids in National Geographic in developing countries, you know, playing at, at the landfill to look for things to play with. That, that was my friend Maria. That was her. That's crazy. And, and again, they were just like, can you even believe how good God is? Can you even believe how good God is that we're right next to a landfill? So sometimes we can find toys. It's our luck is unbelievable. And, and we got these, these felt, you know, this felt to use for blankets. And it even protects us from the rain when it rains because mm -hmm. we have no roof. Just our abundance is unbelievable. Um, so there's a different mindset. There's a different mindset than anything I ever encountered. 
And, um, but you know, what's interesting is very little trauma there, very little trauma. And and that's by their own account. Cause I, I would ask, and this is with my Spanish, which is mediocre at best, <laughs> but, but I, I don't know. I, I don't think I knew the word trauma, but you know, through my halting Spanish, uh, you know, I, I would just say like, are, does this make you sad to think about it? Are you muy triste? Like, are, you know, are you depressed <laughs> when you think about this? And, and, and she said, you know, my siblings and I would just laugh about it and we would play games with all this garbage we would find, you know, down at the, at the dump. I mean, and, and it was funny. And, and of course the, obviously the trauma of her dad dying, there's nothing, you know, positive about that, but the siblings went through it together and it bonded them and it bonded them with their, with their mother. And it was just such a, a warm bonding experience. And so, yeah, they had trauma of getting rained on and it's cold and there's no blankets and they're wet, but they would like sing songs and play games and then they would reenact it. Think about that. That's that village component. So they'd go see their cousins who were just, you know, right, not too far away. And they would all act it out like, oh, were you the other night? We're all like, Ooh, <laughs> like, you know, did you see Juan? Like he could not get cold at all. It was crazy. And, and you act it out with your village and that shakes off the trauma. This woman had 10,000 times the amount of suffering and trauma in her life than I did as a middle-class American kid, but she had one, one ten thousandth the amount of PTSD and trauma because she had a village to work it out with. And so the slightest things would act as stored stress within my system because I didn't have that community to act it out with. So that's, that's what I was thinking about <laughs> when our dog uh, made a mess all over the front carpet. Like if, if, if I didn't have that community of my children to go through this with me and clean it up, <laughs> I mean, that could have been like just kind of a stressful and depressing day. Like what is my life? What is this garbage life? That, that could have been a, a devastating, difficult, frustrating day, but I worked it out in my village. I worked it out with my village. So the reason I bring this up is if you if you ever sense yourself getting triggered, spiraling, fixating on things where it's just you you want to stop but you just kind of can't. You really might have PTSD even if you did not have a horrific dif difficult childhood. It could just be you went through normal stressors but they're all trapped in you. They're trapped in you with no way to let them out. So in our after party, we always do the after party on Patreon, patreon.com slash this is Jen. I'll talk a little more about this and the specific types of, of therapy I did. But if you want to look into it, uh, somatic experiencing is a type of therapy where you kind of you kind of shake it off. But honestly, talking to people about it and moving, there's also um Oh, e EMDR, I think that's what it's called. EMDR is a type of therapy where you, it actually, there are like things that buzz in your hands while you talk through things that can be helpful. But if you just start Googling somatic experiencing, things like that, and frankly, think about the things that stress you out and are upsetting to you while you're out for a jog, and then try to talk about them while you're out for a walk. Combine that acting out physical movement with working through it with your tribe. And then again, look for therapists, things like that. Um, you will be amazed at the progress you will make. And again, we will continue this topic with a little more detail on the Patreon after party, patreon.com slash this is Jen. Get your comedy tour tickets at jfcomedytour.com. I am so looking forward to this tour. It's, it's going to be amazing. We start in, so we go New York, Pittsburgh, Las Vegas, D.C., Philly, Boston. And those are the first few. And then there are a bunch after that. Look it all up at jfcomedytour.com. And we will be back with you next week.